this, this second demo, and, and please be quiet, everyone, so uh, that we might be able to hear what's actually going on. No, no way to hear what's going on. I, I'll just have to uh, uh, sort of narrate. Again, the serial console. This is uh, uh, one of the GeoLX boards, an AMD uh, CPU, the embedded AMD embedded CPU, with uh, 256 megabytes of RAM. And uh, let's see when I reset. Let's go and reset. There we go. Core boot running, and there it's already starting the Linux kernel, and that's the final prompt of the Linux system, which is full up at that time. So this uh, this shows that if you disable all the debugging stuff and you have a really trimmed down kernel, you can get a very nice, very nice uh, startup time. Yeah. Uh, and talking about boot time measurements, I think it's important to, to uh, be careful with the numbers here, or uh, just be careful about what the numbers actually are saying, because different people will use different yeah. metrics for boot time measurements. And of course, everyone wants their numbers to uh, to be the best, so they're going to use what is best for them. What is the this this time measurement actually saying? Is it saying from power supply connected to uh, Windows running with a full desktop? whatever login user or Linux or whatever you have? Or is it from uh, after the mainboard power-up sequence, which might make a difference? It, it sounds uh, silly, but, but it might actually make a big difference. There are about 30 voltages in a PC system, so and, and these all need to start in a special sequence, and that takes time, of course. Or is it from the first instruction fetch, which might be a lot later? Uh, then after all the voltages are up, who knows what's what's going on in the system? So the guy who uh, who's been developing CBIOS, his name is Kevin O'Connor. He did some optimizations for his particular board. He has an um, um, an EPIA board, a VIA EPIA CN, with a C7 CPU and the CN700 chipset. He put core boot and CBIOS in flash, used CBIOS as the payload, and he has uh, he had Grub on a SATA SSD. And this is this is the results he got. He had to spend 350 milliseconds just waiting for what seems to be power sequencing, from he presses from from the time he presses the button to some software actually running. Is is uh, almost half a second. Then he measured that it takes about 50 milliseconds to wait for uh, a communications bus on the mainboard to stabilize. Another 20 milliseconds to configure the memory controller. 10 milliseconds running core boot. Uh, 200 milliseconds waiting for the VGA BIOS to initialize the graphics. And another 10 milliseconds in, in GRUB. And the grand total is, is that it takes 750 milliseconds from the time he presses the power button to when Linux is already starting. Security slide, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to skip this. Well, no, maybe just mention it quickly. Cold boot attack. There was a, a, an attack made public, I guess, the year before last year, so 2008, where even though you power down your computer, the RAM might not still might not be completely empty. And if someone can steal your laptop, or well, desktop for that matter, they can take out the RAM, um, the DIM, and extract all the contents, all the data. And it's really easy to find crypto keys and, and so on. So core boot can be used both in the attack and uh, for defense here, because core boot has RAM initialization, it can start the memory controller and then have a special dump routine inside core boot to read out all the contents without changing anything in RAM. But you could also use it uh, so that when you're shutting down, there's a part of core boot which, which runs and makes sure to clear all the memory before it powers off. Code injection into the operating system. There was a, um, an exploit published um, where part of the BIOS was changed to always rewrite permissions on a particular file in the file in the root file system. 
So whenever you rebooted, this file became uh, world executable with the plus S and everyone had a root shell on the system. That's, that's not something you want in your, your firmware, so it, it might be worthwhile to, um, uh, to look carefully at, at the firmware you're running. There's a lot of good stuff about Core Boot. You can get really fast startup times. Uh, it's open source, C code, DPL. You can audit, you can read it. It's, you don't have to uh, uh, study assembly. Uh, assembly sources a day on end to, to go through the code. We have one tree for all the boards, so there's a, a fair chance of reusability and extensibility there. There's still some challenges. We need more testing. That would be great. There's a testing infrastructure, but it's, it's kind of difficult to hook up boards to be tested to this infrastructure. So even though we have really nice, um, really nice way in this infrastructure to test each commit on actual hardware, because it's um, uh, the fact that it's, it's too difficult to connect boards to this infrastructure means that there's little testing actually done. Everything is built on each commit, and that's a good, good, uh, good start, of course. But it would be very nice also to see boot, boot testing because stuff can break, even though it, it compiles, it, it might not run. And it would be uh, uh, very nice to have all the boards really 100% supported. Most of the boards are implemented by one single developer or a small group of developers, and they are really happy when all the stuff they need is, is working, but that might not be enough for everyone else. So uh, little things on the main board might still need some code to, to work. Most boards are not really far away. There's only very small, very small stuff missing. Um, ACPI, we need to get better at ACPI, but we already have a lot of good progress there, thanks to Rudolf, who's, who's going to talk about it a bit later, and Stefan also. And uh, code is, is great fun, so come, come into the project, please. Um, thanks to Luke for uh, organizing this dev room and uh, some, some links, code.org, and we have a mailing list, and we're on IRC, and uh, the wiki, you can just add anything after the, the URL, and you should get an informative page. Questions? Question, um, yeah? What, what do you use for flashing your flash chip if it's completely screwed? What do you use for <coughs> flashing your flash chip you if it is completely commercial, screwed? Commercial flash chip? Sorry? Do you use a, some commercial flash chip burner? Uh, you can, yeah, sure, that's one way. Uh, you can have a flash flash uh, programmer or a flash writer standalone. Uh, that, that helps, but you don't always have access to that. One thing you can do is, um, is to have a, a use another mainboard instead and hot swap the flash chips. Flash chip programmer, good to have, but, but um, you can also use another mainboard. Yeah, hot swap, that's fine. I think Carl Daniel will, will talk more about yeah. that also in the flash room talk. Another question? Yeah. What are the implications of uh, not fully supporting ACPI? So what are the implications of not fully supporting ACPI? Yeah, sure. Rudolf wants to answer. And there are, so the, I guess uh, I could add there that 
one implication would be that there needs to be a driver to handle some tasks that might otherwise be handled using ACPI on another operating system, or uh, sorry, another firmware. But again, uh, if Linux has that driver, then and and you want to run Linux, then it's 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 fine. No more. Yeah. Okay. Another so question. Your, your, um, uh, your program, your flash chip, and that the first instruction that will be ever uh, done is immediately forwarded. Yes. Yeah. And the, um, I, I presume that you have to configure core boot uh, to say which uh, serial port you are using. Or yeah. Some things like that. Yes. Yes. That's part of the build. And there are also some variables that are set, uh, or some settings that you can change runtime. Well, not runtime, but are read from NVRAM. So you can, if you boot up your operating system, you use NVRAM tool to change the settings, and the next time you reboot, they will take effect. Yeah, and if, you, um, if for example, there's a new motherboard hmm? with a, I don't know, a newer uh, version or a higher plot uh, RAM version, Mm -hmm. how, how do you extract the exact uh, parameters? So a new mainboard with higher clocked RAM or a different type of RAM would be small to medium effort. Uh, Rudolf is, is uh, also going to talk about porting core boot to a new board. And it, it would really be like adding a new mainboard if it's, if it's, say, an upgrade from DDR2 to DDR3. Not all of the work needs to be done as if it was a completely new mainboard, but still some things have to be changed. And, uh, um, and like, like for the RAM, in order to get the, the RAM stabilized, do you wait? Is it, is it some sort of so trial or is it... I'm going to talk about that in the next presentation. Uh, RAM initialization is <coughs> one of the points. Um, if you're, are you staying for that as well, then maybe... Okay, all right. Well, if you have, then maybe we can uh, come back to the question. All right. Yes, uh, there's one laptop supported at the moment, uh, two if you count the OLPC. So the laptop that is supported is, is uh, I mentioned that in the presentation, it's um, the development was funded by uh, the German BSI, and it's a rugged. A rugged laptop, but the components in it are fairly standard, so that code and that effort can be reused for supporting other laptops as well. And I also have um, one board that I'm I'm sort of working on uh, a laptop. Um, they call it a netbook, but I it's a 12 inch. Uh, it has a 12 inch screen, so I don't know if I think it's a netbook. But this is this is the board anyway. This is all that is really in the laptop, except for the screen and the hard drive. Uh, it's a VIA-based platform. It's the Samsung NC20. Um, so hopefully that will will work at some point as well. Does that answer your question? Hmm? Uh, please do, but it, it it might be a lot of work. And especially, it depends a lot on the which components are in your laptop. Uh, Rudolf will will talk about that more also in his presentation. It, it can be really difficult to find out all the information that is is necessary. <coughs> right. So no more questions. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry, I I went over time a bit, but um, um, yeah, I hope you thought it was was interesting. few minutes of, of uh, a break between presentations before I start the next one or should I just go straight away? All right, I'll, I'll continue then. Okay, yeah. So core boot and, and PC technical details is, is the title of this presentation. This is what I, I hope to, to be able to talk about here. 
who am I again? I guess that's the same as, as before. A look at the 30 years of PCs. Um, the PC has been around for a long time and it's changed quite a lot. I'm going to have a look at the ISA bus, the, the first, um, well, actually the second extension bus in the PC, but the, it worked the same way as the first one. So we're going to look at that in order to learn some things that are uh, very important and still applied to uh, a lot of other buses and uh, devices in a modern PC. Something about hardware registers various uh, on, on various buses, uh, ISA, PCI, and uh, MSR. I'm going to talk a bit about NVRAM. I'm going to talk a bit about interrupts. Uh, RAM initialization, uh, cache as RAM is a trick that is used by many firm firmwares today. Uh, GCC and ROMCC. Uh, ROMCC is, is something uh, that came out of core root as well. Uh, the different x86 ex execution modes, real mode, protected mode, system management mode, uh, maybe embedded controllers if there's time, and um, the tanks. This is the same as the, the last slide. I've been doing core boot for a while. I started in Hamburg. I do stuff. Um, the PC in the 1980s, it might have looked like this. There was a CPU, and there was a boot ROM, and there was some RAM connected, and it was a cassette player and a keyboard and an expansion port. And all of this was really connected to the same sort of s s same communications bus. So we went from cassette to DDR3. And this is what a PC might look like today. And there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, we can have four or however many, eight, 16 CPUs maybe. Uh, every CPU might have its own memory controller uh, and the RAM is connected to the memory controller and that's one bus and uh, the different CPUs might be connected together in one special bus and then there's some connection to the north bridge and some I.O. Uh, I.O. stuff. There's a, a whole graphics block which is either in the north bridge or might be on a PCI Express bus off somewhere. Uh, there's another bus down here to something, uh, Southbridge, which has a slower, uh, the old PCI bus. There's some USB and, and IDE. Um, PS2 may be there or might be over here in the Super I.O. LPC is um, a replacement bus for the old ISA bus. And it's, I would say that it's really on every main board uh, these days. There's an LPC bus somewhere. Uh, it can connect to a Super I.O., it can also connect to a boot flash, or there could be an SPI uh, bus which connects from the south bridge to the boot flash. Um, or there could be an SPI in the Super I.O., so it goes via LPC over to the Super I.O., to SPI, and then to the boot flash. And the Super I.O. has lots of, lots of other stuff, also floppy, and um, uh, it could be PS2, as I mentioned, serial, parallel, GPIOs, watchdog. Uh, thermal measuring lots of uh, temperatures on the board and there might also be a microcontroller so another CPU inside the I.O. chip uh, down here that's the embedded controller that I hope to, to uh, uh, rant a bit about also oh yeah and there's the SM bus I mentioned in the, the previous presentation <coughs> that Kevin had some issues waiting for the SM bus to stabilize uh, we'll come back to that when we're talking about RAM initialization because yeah, it's, it's connected to, to the RAM. So uh, this is a, a look at how it might be and it, it can of course be even more complex. You can have, uh, this might not be a single core CPU but you, it might be a four core CPU so you have four CPU cores behind that one connected to one memory controller but connected also to all the other CPUs and yeah, it, it can be pretty complicated. So HT is hypertransport, that's AMD's um, bus for interconnect, or AMD's uh, interconnect between CPUs and IO, IO nodes. Um, Intel developed their own, it's called QuickPath uh, interface, I think, is the abbreviation, the QPI. Um, does the same thing, connection between um, many CPUs in, in a um, um, system which has many CPUs. <coughs> 
So, <coughs> what about this isobus? The way it looked back back when. There is um, I/O and memory access in the x86 CPU. There's an um, um, uh, eight or sixteen bit data communication path. And depending on if you're doing I.O. access or you're doing memory access, the address uh, space has a different size. So for I.O., there's, it's always 16-bit, so you have 64K addresses. Um, these addresses, they're usually called ports. I'm not really sure why, but it, it, that's, if you see port somewhere, it's, <coughs> it's about an I.O. The CPU instructions used for, for I.O. is in B, in W, out B, out W, and in newer CPUs you have the uh, in L and out L instructions also. And these also are available as function calls in, in Linux. Uh, you can do direct I.O. from, from Linux user space if you uh, uh, do some, some preparations first. Mm, I think my Carl Daniel might talk about that also. Yeah. yeah. In the, well, that no, in the lightning talk, I guess. For the port porting on in the alt OS room. Yes. Oh, ah, well, anyway, <clears throat> it's possible to do this direct uh, this this I/O um, communication, these I/O accesses from Linux. And even if there's no ISA bus in the system anymore, it's still possible to do these operations. And where are they going to end up? Well, they will end up on LPC usually, and there might be something listening there. Uh, typically, the super I/O is is what you want to talk to in that case. If you're doing memory accesses, then you have 20 bits of address. And we'll have a look at, um, at how those 20-bit addresses are created in a bit. Uh, in the execution mode uh, stuff. And the memory accesses, they, they all use uh, move instructions. So it's just memory read and memory write. Uh, if you're programming in C, you're reading from a variable that's a, a memory, memory read. Uh, in the really early PCs, that could that memory was external. In the new PC, the memory is actually connected to the CPU itself, and of course has a lot longer uh, address space than than 20, 20 bits. There's a whole bunch of of registers uh, in all the hardware components that we looked at, and in every add-on component that uh, you can connect to a PC. And these register accesses, they will be either I.O. Um, or the, the registers, they will be either be I.O. mapped or they will be memory mapped. On ISA <laughs> hardware, it was kind of common on the, the really old, uh, for example, really old networking cards. You had a, a whole bunch of jumpers. How many people remember those? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you had to choose the, the base I.O. port and you had to choose the interrupt and then you had to make sure there were no conflicts and, and it never worked. Um, uh, they invented this plug and play stuff which was supposed to be clever but uh, ah, uh, I don't know it, in theory it was good but it, I think uh, the implementations weren't really that, that awesome uh, PCI is very different there are no jumpers there's uh, uh, no conflicts the firmware handles all the configuration so core boot does this. That's the, all the, the long printouts that we saw from the uh, the first demo. Is is checking all the PCI devices connected to the system and making sure that they can um, coexist and uh, be accessible at the same time. PCI devices they have what's called configuration space, uh, 256 bytes of registers. They are always reachable. Uh, I think the standard says that it's not necessarily always, but in practice it really is always. Uh, they are reachable on I.O. to ports CF8, uh, hexadecimal, and CFC. This is an, an um, index data combination, so you first write the uh, address of the register you want to access to CF8, and then you do the actual value uh, access on CFC. So, f say you want to access no, I'm not going to, to give you an example because you have to encode um, the PCI address and uh, uh, the, the PCI device address and the, uh, something that's called a function number 
and uh, the register number into this uh, access to CF8. And I can't do that in my head, so um, we'll, we'll um, have to skip that, uh, that example. But anyway, first specify where you want to, um, uh, where you want, what you want to access, and then do the actual access on a different I/O port. This is this is typically always available. If the system has PCI, then this this is going to be there. Uh, this is called the Type One configuration uh, interface, um, and maybe you've seen that in the Linux kernel sources. You can choose what, what type of um, uh, configuration access method that's going to be used. This is also what Coreboot uses. Coreboot used to support another access method, but it was never used, so we threw that out. Um, configuration space can also be reached. Uh, via memory mapped uh, registers, and that's called mmconfig. Not every system supports it, but uh, if they do, it's it's um, more convenient because you just access what could be a memory address. Uh, it looks just like any other uh, address in memory, but there's no memory there. Instead, you're uh, reading and writing. Well, there is memory, but the memory is, is small registers on some PCI device, and it's not the, the dim the main uh, RAM in the system. So that's that's handy, and it's also faster. These I/O accesses tend to be pretty slow because they are uh, so so old and um, uh, legacy compatibility uh, stuff on the bus. The 16 first <coughs> bytes out of these 256 are standardized by the PCI uh, PCI standard. So every single PCI device is going to have the first 16 bytes exactly the same. Uh, well, not identical contents, but identical structure. And the first four bytes show the vendor and the device ID, for example. Uh, there's also information about which interrupt uh, is, is going to be used for this device and uh, a couple of other things. Uh, interrupt polar polarity, um, detected uh, errors on the, the communication um, on the PCI bus by this device. If this device is a bus master and much... Um, um, uh, a whole bunch of, of other uh, settings as well. And there are base address registers, or bars, as they're called. So maybe these 256 minus 16 bytes, uh, these 240 bytes, maybe that's not enough for, for being able to, for, for doing everything that this PCI device can do. Maybe you need uh, a lot more. If it's a graphics card, for example, you want access to the graphics memory. And uh, 240 bytes isn't really a lot of graphics memory today, so you need uh, some, some way to create a window into the graphics memory that is on the graphics card. So then you will configure a, a bar, or well, the firmware will configure uh, a bar, a base address register, saying to the PCI device that when a PCI, when the PCI bus sees an access to this particular address, then that is meant for you. So the, every, every PCI device looks at the traffic on the bus and uh, only the one that has been configured to accept accesses to this particular address is going to accept them and decode them and process them. So in case the firmware does a, a, a half-assed job and sets up base address registers which conflict, then you're going to have more than one device react to um, uh, stuff going on on the PCI bus and nothing's going to be working. So in the example of a graphics card, the base address register would uh, set up a memory mapping because you want the graphics memory to be accessible as memory. But base address registers uh, can also be used for I.O. mapping. Um, in that case, you have um, some number of I.O. ports that you want to um, end up on this particular PCI device, and um, then you, um, you the firmware, <coughs> set a base address register in the same way, which tells the PCI device to decode accesses, I/O accesses to this particular port. This is really common for for uh, PCI devices to have one or or both uh, memory and an I/O bars. It could even be several. I think in the 200 and uh, sorry in the 16 bytes 16 standard bytes I think there's room for four uh, base address registers I'm not uh, no sorry it's in the full 256 it's it's room for 
uh, four or maybe even more base address registers. So you can have one PCI device that has several different uh, memory regions or I.O. regions uh, that it's, it's decoding. There are also the MSRs. Yeah, you can almost, almost can see it. Model-specific registers. That's low-level registers in the CPU itself, in the North Bridge, in the I.O. controller, stuff like that. I'm going to come back to uh, to some of those. NVRAM, I mentioned that. It's also called CMOS. Uh, I don't know if it I probably doesn't use CMOS technology anymore, but uh, the name has has um, uh, has stuck. It's uh, in its simplest form, the basic <coughs> form. It's uh, 128 bytes of um, uh, battery-backed RAM. And it's stored in the real-time clock chip. And the real-time clock chip, in turn, is usually part of another chip in a modern PC. But in the original PC, that was one uh, Motorola chip um, on its own. Now it's usually in the Super I.O. or maybe in the chipset. So these uh, 100, 100 odd bytes, they survive power down. You can have the system disconnected forever and, well, not forever, but for a long time. And the contents is, is still going to be the same. Um, also, the, the clock keeps ticking, of course, when the system is shut down. That happens there. The standard way to access these registers is, um, again, uh, <coughs> one of these index, index value I.O. sequences. Um, you write the address um, you want to access to port 70, and then you read or write port 71 hexadecimal to, to read or write that value. And this is where all the BIOS settings are stored, typically, and this is also what NVRAM tool um, messes with. So you give it the layout file of which bits are, are which setting, and um, it will do all the translation and um, make sure you don't overwrite any wrong bits, and um, it, it um, accesses these ports 70 and 71, and it, it works out well. There are also extended registers, another 128 bytes, and um, there can also be another 256 bytes in other places, but that works just the same way. Uh, ports 72 and 73 are, are really common. If you want to have a look at a driver for this in Linux, it's drivers car and and uh, somewhere in Arc x86 there are the, uh, a couple of macros which translate to the out, out B and, and in B, which will do the actual, actual port accesses. Interrupts. How many recognize this picture? Oh, all right, excellent. How about eight, nine, ten, or so? So this is uh, um, the legacy legacy PIC programmable interrupt controller. The way interrupts uh, works in in the beginning, uh, single CPU systems. I guess all the way back to 8088, the, the original PC. There were 15 usable interrupt signals, uh, interrupt inputs to these two interrupt controllers that are, are connected together. And the chain of events is, is uh, as described here, a device, each, well, typically each device would, one device would connect to each of these inputs, uh, 0 through 15. The device wants attention from the CPU because something has happened. Maybe there's a byte uh, coming in from the modem or from the keyboard, or maybe the, it's uh, possible now to send a byte out to the modem or to the keyboard or wherever, a network card for that matter. So the device signals an interrupt, um, pulls one of these, these strings, the pick notices this, the interrupt controller, and um, it will, if it's one of these, these high ones, it's going to trickle through to the master. And uh, the, only, the only interrupt signal going to the CPU is the actual uh, int. That one. Uh, yeah, so the, the 
one interrupt signal from the master pick is, is all that is going to the <coughs> CPU. The CPU only accepts one single interrupt signal. Um, but what about all these devices? How does that work out? Well, so when there's an interrupt, the CPU will acknowledge that it, it received this interrupt signal uh, by pulling on the this int A uh, signal to the interrupt controller. And then it's going to, to uh, wiggle that interrupt uh, acknowledge signal a little bit more, which causes then the, the programmable interrupt controller to write an address for the interrupt handler or uh, the interrupt vector <coughs> to the data bus. So the CPU says, okay, I got the interrupt. The CPU says, okay, what should I do now? The interrupt controller has been programmed, hence programmable interrupt controller, has been programmed to know that interrupt this and that should be handled by code running at this particular address in memory. So the CPU says, okay, what should I do now? The programmable interrupt controller replies, you should go to this address in memory uh, where the interrupt handler lives. So it writes that out to the data bus. The CPU reads the address and jumps to the address. And um, there's an interrupt handler running in the CPU. So there was, was, uh, this was with just one CPU. Then there's only one interrupt signal, even though we can have many interrupt sources. And uh, yeah, hopefully this explains all the interrupt problems that were with the old ESA cards a little bit. OK, what about when there are multiple CPUs? <coughs> then it gets fun again. Um, there's always one bootstrap processor. That's the, the first processor that uh, comes up running when the system is starting. That is all arranged in hardware, which, uh, which processor will be running when the power comes on. Then any, any other CPUs are going to be application processors. So there's always only one running in the beginning, and it has to, um, uh, well, actually, that's not true. That depends on if it's AMD or Intel. I think one of them, everyone comes up running, and they have to agree to stop if they're not the BSP. But there has already been a decision made in hardware so that there's only one which is designated the BSP. And it should check if it's the BSP and the <coughs> other ones should stop. And the, the, the BSP will continue. Anyway, inside of these CPUs, uh, there's a local APIC. So APIC is, I guess, advanced programmable <laughs> interrupt controller. And uh, the APICs, the, the local APICs, there's one in each CPU, as I said. They communicate with each other. So this, this, for example, hypertransport, or it could be uh, some front side bus or, um, or such, system bus, whatever. They also connect with this IO APIC, uh, which is the one dealing with, um, well, this looks familiar. This is the, the uh, same, the legacy PIC arrangement, which is still there, even if you have an APIC. It might not be used. Uh, it, it, if you, so the APIC situation, it needs to be configured before it's being used. And if it's not configured, then the system is still going to be using this legacy PIC uh, setup. But if you configure the, the full-on APIC situation, then you, um, you get the local APICs talking to each other and talking to the IO APIC, and you can do really flexible mapping of all the interrupts coming into the IO APIC and all of the interrupts that can be generated by the local APICs also, because these, uh, by the time we have multiple CPUs, the CPUs also have a lot of more functionality included than maybe the older ones did. So for example, we have um, dimension already machine check exceptions, MCEs, if, uh, if the CPU detects that it has broken, it can trigger an APIC interrupt, and that can call into an interrupt vector somewhere. So the interrupt vectoring part is, is still the same. The local APIC will make sure that the CPU runs, goes off and runs some configured interrupt handler. Um, the difference is that, the difference from the legacy PIC situation is that well, first of all, the I.O. 
I/O stuff, which is connected to all the peripherals and the PCI bus down here. That's that's separated out. And the local Apex, they also they have support for I think 256 interrupt sources instead of the 15. So um, there's there's plenty of, of interrupt signals available. Um, they can come from interrupts can come from as I mentioned from within the Apex itself, from within the CPU itself. The Apex has uh, also a timer which can generate interrupts. Um, and yes. Yeah, of course, the APIC enabled there, it has to be enabled, as I, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, here's also the system management interrupt signal, which goes into the CPU, and not the APIC, in, in this drawing, at least. So, a lot more complicated, but basically still the same principle. You have programmed the, the PIC, the interrupt controller, to... Uh, with, with all the interrupt vectors and when the interrupt happens it will send the CPU to run the, the code that it should but uh, there are a lot of possibilities with uh, many different interrupts here I think Rudolf will also uh, come back to this for RAM initialization how are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, for RAM initialization what do we have to do there? well uh, the, our goal in, in RAM initialization is to configure this, this thick red connection over here. It could be DDR2, it could be DDR, it could be DDR3. Uh, in any case, it's, it's a lot of work. We need to know... Uh, we need to know exactly what kind of RAM is, is connected here on, on this side. And the same for all of the CPUs and, and or memory controllers which have RAM connected. And, um, well, since this communication link isn't working, what do we do? Uh, we then have to use this SM bus. Uh, so from the CPU, we're, we're doing memory configuration, we go through the north bridge, south bridge, out onto the SM bus, and follow this green line and talk to this, this little green guy, uh, which is an, an E-square prom on each DIM. It's a, a small serial EEPROM. It stores a couple of parameters. Um, what size is this memory? What, uh, how fast is it? Is it registered? Is it not registered? Etc. Etc. All the parameters that, uh, yeah, timings supported by this memory module. All the, the stuff that is needed to configure the memory controller correctly. And I'm not going to go into great detail with the memory controller configuration uh, because it's, it's so complicated. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to say that uh, DDR2, at least, requires some brute force searching uh, for finding the correct uh, tuning of the timing between the memory controller and the actual DIM. So the firmware has to, to search through uh, all possible settings or many possible settings for the, the, the tuning parameters in order to find the one that is, is, is working really well. And worst case, that, that uh, parameter could actually change with the temperature in the room depending on how the board is, is laid out, the, the traces on the, the main board. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Mm, caches RAM is, is used in core boot. This RAM initialization stuff. So, when the RAM initialization is running, there is no RAM available. All right? That means it's not possible to run C code because C compilers, they assume that there is RAM available. And RAM is used for the stack, which is used to call functions. So, we can't use C code when we're doing this RAM initialization. And back when memory technology uh, were, was, was simpler, or the memory buses were simpler, it was kind of okay to do, I guess, the memory initialization, the RAM initialization in assembly. We could do it in assembly language, and it, it, it wasn't all that bad, it wasn't too long, it, it, it was okay. But with this, for example, with this brute force search stuff that is in DDR2, and which I can only assume is even more complex in DDR3, it's really not something that we want to, to do in assembly anymore. 
So uh, one way around it is to use cache as RAM, um, which means that part of the, the CPU cache is um, used as memory. And in fact, it is memory. It's really fast memory. But normally, it isn't addressable. But it's, there's a way. Uh, it's documented by Intel, even. You just, it doesn't exactly, they, doesn't, they don't exactly describe why you would do it, or um, uh, I guess, well, they say how you do it, but not exactly that the result is cache as RAM and that you can run stuff without having RAM. You have to read between, between the lines a bit. Uh, but the information is there. You set up caching, and then you make sure that you load all the code that you want to run into the cache. And then you make sure that you don't run anything else and that you don't access any code outside that. And if you do that, it's, it's possible to, to have C code running without any RAM active. So that's, that's, that's used by Core Boot for um, many main boards, but uh, not for all yet. Our ambition is, is to, have, to have this for, for every main board. Uh, we have the caches RAM support for uh, a lot of different CPUs and, and platforms for AMD 64 and for GeoDLX and I think also for the VSC7, uh, but all the boards aren't really using it yet. It can be tricky to do this in a general manner. We want, we want caches RAM support for, for everything, of course, but different platforms, different systems, they have uh, restrictions on how big uh, areas you can use for caches RAM and where they need to live, in, in uh, which addresses you can use for this. So it's, uh, it's not really easy to, uh, uh, to, to do this cache around setup always. Another option, um, so that's, that's GCC. If you have caches RAM, you can use GCC compiled code. GCC assumes that there's memory. But um, before we, uh, we started using caches RAM, we, um, we had another thing, another solution. Uh, ROM CC was, was created by one of the Core Boot developers. Uh, it's a, a C compiler, custom, custom made, one big source file. It's really long. Uh, it generates machine code, which doesn't need any RAM. Um, it cannot. It, it, uh, of course, the x86 is, um, is sort of limited when it comes to the number of registers it has. So the C code cannot be infinitely complex because every, every time you call a function, the C compiler has to reserve one register. So eventually you run out of registers and then the compiler will, will uh, complain and is, is not going to be able to compile the, the source code you have. But if you have simple, simple source code, and if you if you write it in a in a certain way, uh, in lines for example can can help. Then uh, ROM CC does does a, a fairly good job. There has been a couple of bugs in there which have been a bit difficult to track down. But I, I think uh, the the ROM CC code base is 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 pretty good by now. How Question. How can we make sure that we don't end up in those? So, <coughs> so, so how how can the ROM CC compile those in any? In uh, case that, that, that there's going to be not that much code. You basically cannot. Uh, so the, the question is how, how does ROM CC know at compile time when it runs out of storage? Exactly. Yes. Well, it has a model of the CPU that it's going to run on. And it's yeah. at, at compile time, it fills up that model, uh, it fills up the registers. And eventually, if it runs out of registers, and it's, it's impossible for the compiler to store the previous location, then, then it's going to fail. Okay. Um, then you can't do that function call at, at, I guess, level eight or nine. The compiler knows about the CPU, but yes. he probably doesn't know about the self-modifying dynamic code on the front end. The, the compiler surely knows about the CPU and the, the, the depth yes. level he, he can, can cope with. Yes. But he, he cannot know about um, somebody creating artificial calls. And, 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 and artificial see, calls. Um, if, if you have dynamic calls, or generally it just takes your own mm, No dynamic calls. I, I think function pointers are not support. Uh, yeah, for example. Uh, well, yeah, it could be supported as long as there's a register free 
but then you have to handle it on your own. Well, it, it would be it would it would require one extra register, I guess, for, for saving the, the return or saving the function pointer somewhere. Okay. Um, Let's take this offline. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Uh, well, Got short idea. explanation for this. Um, basically, every function call is inline to be on CC. So, um, if you have, um, if um, there is a function which calls itself, a ROM CC will try to inline and uh, eventually detect that you have an infinite loop or something like that. So, recursion or something like that, function pointers, forget it. Uh, because if you can't uh, do it in a fully inline uh, assembly code uh, with no calls at all, um, mm -hmm. it can't be compiled by ROM CC. That's the trick. Okay. So um, I hope that is better. Mm, basically, everything has to be unrolled. Yeah, it, right. It, it unrolls the, the source code completely, right. Okay. I think it, it should be possible to implement function pointers, though, but I, I, it might not be in the in the, in the current code. Excellent, thank you. Can do it. Okay, all right. Um, still, ROMCC is is um, even though we're <coughs> moving away from ROMCC code, um, it's I think it's still useful. For example, serialize I believe is the the ROM shell for serialize is compiled with uh, ROMCC, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's. it's really an amazing um, effort <coughs> that, that went into it. Execution modes in the x86. There's uh, the, the good old real mode, the classic execution mode that um, every modern CPU still starts up in. You have a bunch of 16-bit registers. The ones up there, I hope I don't forget, I didn't forget one. Uh, the first four are segment registers and the rest are, uh, they have sort of uh, intended purposes, but you can mix and match almost freely. Not quite, but, but you can mix and match a bit. And uh, every, every memory address, as I said, in um, real mode is 20 bits. So two of these 16-bit registers need to be combined. Uh, and I've, I've always uh, seen that being called segmented addressing. And it's written in the form segment register colon offset register. They're both 16 bits, and the address ends up being uh, the segment register shifted left by 4 or multiplied by 16, and then add on the offset register. So, for an example, if ds equals f000 hexadecimal and SI equals 6000 hexadecimal, then the DSSI segmented address would be a physical address of F6000. So, um, yeah, that way you can reach a full megabyte of, um, of address space. <laughs> <laughs> then, and this was in 8086, 8088, 186, and 286. And then with the 386, there was the protected mode. Actually, the, there was one protected mode in the 286 as well, but it was so so different that I'm not going to, to bother. Um, I don't remember even uh, all the details. Um, but the, the protected mode as we know it and, and usually call it is the one that came in 386. It has a, a concept of privilege levels where um, you can specify that some some uh, uh, parts of code is allowed to do some things and and not some other things. And this is also this is of course what every modern operating system relies on in order to do security uh, properly. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do uh, anything, even as a, a user in Linux, for example, but only the root user is, is really allowed, or the kernel is, is really allowed to do, um, to do anything in the system. When uh, one of these privileged instructions, or when you're trying to do, if you're trying to do something that you're not allowed to do, then the 386 or, or a protected mode CPU is going to, is going to, uh, is, is going to uh, throw an exception. And this can be handled by an interrupt handler, and then all the, the APIC stuff comes comes into play, and you end up running some other piece of software which can sort of detect what happened, and then it, it goes all the way back and tells the user that, oops, you did something that you're not supposed to do. 
uh, instead of um, crashing or whatever. Also included in the protected mode is paging. Uh, this is a, a reference um, table or a lookup table for addresses. So you're using an address, but it's not like up here. If, if you say you want this address, it might actually be a completely different address. Uh, so there's, um, there's a translation layer in between the address you're using, the virtual address, and the address that is actually seen on the bus, the physical address. The protected or the, well, protected mode, uh, not actually protected mode, this is more than 386. The 386 added 32-bit registers. So there are E versions of, of all the ones from AX uh, out to SP that are 32 bits. The lower 16-bit uh, are the same. And some of those can be divided into 8-bit registers even. And then uh, the, the set, segment registers, they changed into uh, what is called selectors. It's the same register name, it just has a different function. Uh, in protecting mode, the selector will look up a uh, look up a, a data structure which has information about paging and uh, privilege instructions, and also base and limit. So this is all uh, part of the translation. Uh, depending on what you put in, in CS, if you say, uh, put for example zero, then you're going to get the first entry in this lookup table of, of selectors or uh, descriptors. And that means if you address, um, if you access address zero, it's actually going to be somewhere, uh, somewhere completely different. But if you then change uh, CS to be eight instead, and you move one step forward in this table, the d um, global descriptor table or the local uh, descriptor table, as they're called, um, and then you, uh, it means if you're accessing zero, uh, it, it gets a completely different meaning. The limit specifies how big a uh, memory block you can access. Starting from, from the base address. So system management mode, uh, I mentioned it's triggered by uh, system management interrupt. When the processor enters system management mode, it's always running in real mode but it's free to switch to protect the mode if it wants to. Interrupts are always disabled and the debug traps are always disabled. So when you're running in, in system management mode, you're really, uh, you're really isolated. It's, it's, uh, the machine is all yours. System management mode uh, can be entered by, as I mentioned, IO traps or even MMIO traps. So the memory maps register accesses. Machine check exceptions, uh, when the, the CPU detects that it's broken, and APIC, uh, anything in the APIC can also generate uh, or uh, result in system management mode execution. Embedded controllers, I'm out of time. So unfortunately, uh, no rant about embedded controllers. It's the 851 in the Super IO. It can do a whole lot of stuff, which sort of messes up the system because it's transparent. And it might also be very difficult to, to detect But yeah, no. Thanks to Luke. And questions, <coughs> if there's time. Yep. How does RonCC uh, store local variables and variables pass to functions? In registers. Okay. So you can have only a few uh, local yes. variables? Yes. Oh. Yep. On the super IO, the uh, AD. Good question. So it depends on, uh, sometimes the 8051 there, it can be a standalone chip. And if it's a standalone chip, it can have a built-in firmware. But it could also be sharing uh, with the, the main, um, sharing the boot flash with the main firmware in the system. So the, say the first, uh, the first 50, 56 kilobytes is the firmware for the, for the microcontroller, the embedded controller. That's, that's fairly common. Or it can have its own flash chip. Yep, it can, has, it, it can definitely has, have its own flash chip as well. Yep, yep. Question? The current world in system management mode. System management mode? Uh, 
does it also come from the Thorling? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you, you could actually disable some parts. Uh, yes. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. And uh, someone also earlier asked the question if. So the question was uh, where. The system management code that is run in Corebook, where does it come from? And the answer is it, it is also in Corebook. We have two separate implementations of um, system management code handlers in Corebook. One is from AMD, that's the one for the GeoLX, uh, but they open sourced that. And then there's uh, uh, the code that Stefan Reinauer wrote for the Intel, Intel platforms. And I think, well, maybe Rudolf, you also wrote some small system management mode code for the AMD64. Yeah, but it's all included in the core boot, core boot source, and uh, there's full control, and it does really very little because it, it wants to get out of the way. All right. Okay, thank you very much.